to talk about the alt right. Um, they're they're becoming a little less prominent right now because they don't have the lightning rod that is Donald Trump to uh, to kind of galvanize a lot of people. It's he was a very very easy <laughs> easy galvanization tool. I'm not gonna lie. Um, but there are still some issues where the alt right is concerned that need to be addressed, and there are things that, honestly, you don't think about all the time. Because when you think about somebody who's alt right, you might think of a proud boy. You're thinking of somebody who's like going around trying to beat up liberals and and wants to throw commies out of helicopters. You're thinking of somebody who's you know mean and nasty. They're a neo Nazi. What we don't think about sometimes is that sometimes the alt right operates as a support network. And that's a problem. Um, so here's here's kind of an example. Uh, extremist groups, especially alt-right groups, generally are about 75% or more male. They're very, very masculine. Now, there's this idea called aggrieved entitlement. Uh, basically the idea that, you know, the world promised you something. So let's let's think of the the world yeah. that's presented to us, you know, from the 50s. It's a man's world. It it really is. When you take that world and you, you grow somebody up with the expectation that they're going to inherit that world, and we have this more egalitarian world now that does not favor them the same way that it would, you create one of two people. You either create a progressive who realizes that, you know, the world didn't make this same promise to, to women and minority groups, so they start arguing for progressive causes, or you get somebody who when they weren't prompt they didn't get the world they were promised uh they feel emasculated uh they start you know arguing that instead of equality uh, the world owes them this promised man's world now when you couple this with somebody who has depression and anxiety about stuff like this you create an internal mechanism for people where they are almost trapped in their own head and when you're yeah. tra when you're trapped that way you end up seeking out an in group because the out group doesn't think like you. The out group will tell you, no, you're not entitled this man's world. You're not entitled uh, this this uh, hierarchy that you think that you should be properly placed in. What's it like? Jordan Peterson's a good example of this, where he I was saying kind of that, where he he will go, you know, you've got this proper place in your hierarchy, and and men are for order, and and uh, femininity is chaos, and you find a lot of that stuff when you are in this position, you become very vulnerable. And if there are other people that have this toxic mindset that the world owes them this, this pro men's world, you are very vulnerable for falling into those people. And the worst part is a lot of people who are like progressive liberals, when you come at them, when you come to them with your depression, your anxiety about this, you're likely to get shut down because, you know, people like me are going to look at you and go, you want a world that is necessarily in favor of you and against women or against trans people or against minorities. But on the flip side, when you bring those anxieties to the alt-right, they're going to go, no, 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 no. Your depression's valid. Everything you're doing, it's, it's perfectly fine. It's okay. We know why you are like this, and they give you a convenient enemy. That enemy can be anything from feminism to games journalists to Satan, if it's the religious side of things, or even, um, you know, you might have the enemy be the Jewish question that will come up a lot in these groups, especially when we're talking about the alt-right. But I've gone on a little bit about that, uh, Cavernack. What about, you fo used to focus a lot on this kind of content. What angles have you seen this get approached by? Yeah, so um, the the racial like alt, alt alt right not isn't necessarily totally about white people because there are alt right movements in like Japan, for example. But what the like kind of what you're saying, the alt right is kind of like someone who's promised the white man's world, and I think that that's what Donald Trump represents in in a way. Like make America great again. It's not a you know a coincidence that comes after President Obama, where to a lot of white people is like. A black man is now a president and someone you've always been told is lesser than you is now in charge of you and i read a good article when i was doing some research I forgot what it was for from 2008 about racists who voted for obama and it's like they voted for him for economic reasons essentially but like the racism didn't go away and it was so bad during the obama years i'm sure you remember and a lot of people watching today and it's just you know i think van jones called it like a white lash um, when donald trump was elected 
so that's that's one part of it but then you know you talk about hierarchies and stuff i i, I want to pivot a tiny bit in terms of the racial dynamic is pretty strong in the sense that Muslims was a big, you know, Islam is a big galvanizing factor from the alt-right. And I've made videos talking about how new atheism, and I'm an atheist myself, so don't, people in the chat don't think I'm insulting atheists. New atheism is a specific ideology. It's um, essentially like a liberal ideology with, with a neocon foreign policy. And what Richard, neo... This sounds a lot like sorry. a Sam, this sounds like a lot like a Sam Harris kind of deal Sam, Sam Harris Christopher Hitchens Richard Dawkins these types of people where is Islam is painted as a monolith which is completely incompatible with Western society and they like you know the alt-right were massive on the things like Cologne uh, where there were sexual assaults by um, I forgot if it was uh, m migrants or refugees or even you know people who'd lived in Cologne but basically it took a very racial dynamics you had like the stuff in France and the UK uh, a lot less stuff in the US, which is stuff where this stuff really thrived. Uh, but basically, it was like these guys aren't compatible. Uh, and now they're coming into the country. Uh, and, you know, there was even crazy conspiracies about um, George Soros paying for the migrant caravan it, it, on the southern border of the America. But it was also filled with ISIS or some crazy stuff like that. But it's kind of like this, this version for them is like keep the other away. And Muslims became the massive other. And they would cherry pick examples about all this stuff to really galvanize the right. And that's why I always said, you know, the crusade by new atheists against the left, while also being against Islam was like, look, the leftist policies of being equality, you know, for equality won't get you anywhere. Because look what multiculturalism has done. Sweden is another one. They talk about Sweden like being, a, you know, I think it's um, being a war zone. There was lots of propaganda about that. So I think these sorts of, you know, migration and the changing face of the West is just not good for anyone. But of course, like you were saying, it's primarily the white people having a white lash where the changing face of, you know, who makes up companies or who makes up government is insulting when you think a white person should have this privilege. And it's also funny, these are the same people who deny white privilege even exists. And it even kind of seeps into the mainstream like if you remember the white south african farmers discourse and i made a video about this as well from 2018 and i think the the killings of white farmers was at its lowest point in 25 years in 2018 um most of the attacks on them weren't even racially motivated but you had people like lauren Southern making these documentaries about so some sort of genocide against white people in south africa by black people and you had a lot of simps coming out for apartheid and everything like that and it's just this mindset that if you're white in a western country and i'd say south africa was probably you know western in terms of western aligned you are owed this stuff and the opposite happening is bad so if the south african government wants to nationalize more land maybe at the expense of white farmers which is what they tried to do but they haven't successfully done this they can't even get it passed in their parliament the white people see that as a direct attack against their privilege of course their privilege just like in america is completely created on colonial exploitation and creating a system where white people are at the top, whether that's in America with the natives, um, even you know, Latinos settled in the South or anything like that. And then in South Africa, obviously with Dutch and British versus native uh, African tribes and stuff. So yeah, I'd say the main thing in the racial dynamic, and we can get into the more like ridiculous stuff a bit later. Um, I'll, I'll give it back to you in a sec, but the racial thing, like you're saying, is that like white people are entitled to something and in the 21st century where white people are you know having their privilege and prominence challenged to a lot of people if, if you know you're a you know white high school dropout and you've been told you know get a job uh you know get a house get a family get a car and that doesn't really happen and you're still living in your you know parents house e even someone like like me uh, as well ha has that kind of disillusionment with the economy but if you brainwash someone to think it's based on racial factors and not economic factors, then that's why you get people finding some sort of solidarity in the, you know, the alt-right between other white men. So I do like that, uh, not, well, I, I say I like, that's not really the proper word here. Um, but there is an issue with that disillusionment because what happens is any when you are disillusioned with a a way that the world is set up, anybody who offers you a solution is a lot more enticing and 
also, if depending on the distance between the world that you think you were promised and the world you were land you landed in, the likelihood that you will be okay with uh, coming on down on an extreme position is higher. As an example, on on a positive end, you know, let's say that you are a leftist and you want a complete overthrow of the government as it exists right now, and you want things to be you know, taken over by workers' co-op. That is that is an extreme position because it requires a full-on revolutionary set of how things function. Yeah. But that's brought on because of the dissonance between the world that you should you believe we should have and the world we live in. The closer the world we live in is to the your normative reality, the less likely you are to be an extremist, because there's less to, to pull in. <laughs> Extremism isn't necessarily the the only issue. Like radicalization can be used for both good and ill. I would say the alt right is when it's being used for ill. So if you believe that you've got this white man's world where uh, phrenology has, through the magic of confirmation bias, uh, argued that your skull shape means that you are more intelligent than than black people, you're more intelligent than than other races. Oh, but you definitely totally are not racist because you've given. Uh, you've argued that Asian people are more smart than you. This is a, a conceit made by the bell curve. Uh, you've got a million and one confirmation bias apologetics to, to comfortably sit in your worldview that is extreme, even if that worldview is not accurate. But because, like I mentioned earlier, if you find an in-group that is willing to grab those anxieties, you're you're not in your proper place in society. You don't feel like you're doing the right things. Uh, and you feel like you've done the right things, but society hasn't put you where you needed to be. That in-group is going to grab you, and they're going to almost predatorily stoke those flames. Where you're going to come in, and you're going to go, well, I wanted a man's world. And they're going to go, well, you need, you know, you, you weren't able to find a wife. This is where you find some crossover with incels, where they'll go, no, 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 no. You weren't able to find a wife not because of any fault of your own, not because you have some issue that uh, makes you a toxic person. You're not toxic. The world around you is toxic. It's become so much more feminized. It's become so much more feminine. Now, you know, women get to have it both ways. This, this is not my position. This is a position that you'll hear in some of these circles. Women get to have it both ways where they get to argue that toxic men are bad, but they're going to go for the toxic men instead of going for you when you're a nice guy. You're a good person. You get to hear all this stuff, and it preys on your depression, because now, instead of your depression being something that you need to be taking to a therapist, maybe seeing medication for, maybe there's something that happened in your past that you need to address, instead of all of that, you're being given these enemies from outside. They're responsible for your position in life. They're responsible for your issues. And you need to handle that. If you're suffering from a mental issue, be it anxiety or depression, what have you, you will you can end up being galvanized so long as you've got somebody to blame for your lot in life. Uh, you could say, well, it's it's not my fault that I'm in this dead end job and I am in this uh, unfortunate scenario. It's the world's fault because I wasn't able to take my proper place. I wasn't able to, you know, be the late 50s idea of the man with the family throwing the football to my son that I thought I was going to be able to, that was taken away from me because, you know, women won't sleep with me or because uh, black men took something from me there or immigrants took my job or what have you. There's a million and one angles that this gets, gets uh, operated under the, 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 the takeaway from this is that the alt-right has no shortage of scapegoats. If you feel, if you feel like you should have an enemy, the alt-right can give you an enemy. The alt-right can give you a Jew. The alt-right can give you a brown person. The alt-right can give you a female. They can give you a games journalist. They can give you something. If you're religious and you need a religious enemy, they can give you Islam. If you're a racist, you need a racial enemy. They've got no shortage of those. If you're a gamer, they will find you an Anita Zarkeesian. There is always someone they can put in front of you and say, this is our enemy. We have a shared enemy. Your depression, your anxiety, all of that is valid. And all of that can be fixed if we just stop this enemy. But, unfortunately, uh, there's a a thing that is noted by another YouTuber, Innuendo Studios, uh, on this. And it's that 
people who find themselves into the alt-right don't generally find happiness there. When the alt-right's losing, nobody's happy. They all, they're, they're only happy when they're winning, but when they're winning, it's only for a little bit of time because it always is predicated on finding an enemy making them suffer. If they defeat an enemy, they've got to find another enemy. If they, if they succeed in making sure that someone like Zoe Quinn or Anita Zarkeesian is no longer in good repute, they're only going to be happy for the, the amount of time they can celebrate that victory. They have to go and necessarily find a new enemy or they start eating themselves. No, I think I think you make an interesting point about the enemy thing, and and I I going to tell you about something you were saying earlier in terms of like even like scapegoating your place in the world, and I think Jordan Peterson's a very interesting person in this pipeline to the alt right. Now, before we go any further, I, you know people always get on me. I'm not saying Jordan Peterson holds um, you know national socialist views or anything. I, to my, to me, he's a conservative. Um, and he might be a pretty, you know, deluded conservative, but he, he's one, but he's one who helps people focus their anger and hate at people. And there's a reason alt right people love Jordan Peterson. And just as a side note, um, I'll never be, um, I never stop being frustrated about how liberals help normalize people who really bring nothing new to the table. With Jordan Peterson, to me, it's anti-communism and anti-feminism packaged in some sort of, you know, like intellectual. Um, I don't know, rapping, even though I don't think he's he's the smartest guy ever. But um, with, with someone like him, you know, cultural Marxism is, you know, fascist conspiracy. Uh, there's similar ones like Judeo-Bolshevism. Um, and with Jordan Peterson, the funny thing is he pretends cultural Marxism doesn't really have links to Jewish people in terms of the conspiracy theory. But in Jordan Peterson's view, uh, leftists have taken over academia um, and cultural Marxism derives from one uh, school, the Frankfurt School, which is made up of Jewish people, which was talking about like basically changing culture radically uh, in the 1930s. So like equality for the races, equality for the sexes, things like, things like that. But they had more like radical views. But basically what people like Jordan Peterson believe, this has infected everyone. And he, he made his fight on you know transgender uh, pronouns and stuff. But he has, a, has something to blame now. And, and you'll see this discourse a lot. Um, I went to university, I did uh, undergrad, I did a master's in history and international relations. And uh, if I ever bring that up, not out of some sort of vanity in terms of ha having a conversation with someone about this stuff, they'll say, dude, um, you're just brainwashed by the Marxists. And I think it plays into your point that you're owed something in terms of like, you might have been owed with education, but now it's better and you have a solidarity. I didn't go to university or I didn't have the opportunity to, but that's good because I'm not brainwashed in feminist politics or Marxist politics. And someone like Jordan Peterson is frustrating that the liberals normalize him is that by explicitly touting cultural Marxism, it's really, really not hard to jump off that to Judeo-Bolshevism where Jordan Peterson's version is leftist. Well, add in, well, yeah, those leftists are also being controlled by like George Soros or, Jew, or Jews in general, Jewish conspiracy. Have you heard of this thing called Judeo-Bolshevism where there's like a Jewish conspiracy to take over the entire world through Marxism? Again, something talked about in Nazi Germany. It's really not hard to jump from cultural Marxism to Judeo-Bolshevism. And it's all based on, you know, like you're saying, dissatisfaction with the world, your place in the world. And I guess with Jordan Peterson, it's like picking up on this backlash in America of conservatives against academia. But it's just, you know, it, it, it makes me, me laugh, but it's depressing. But just to end on this little bit is you were talking about gamers and Anita Sarkeesian. I made a video talking about anti-SJW ideology essentially all progressive politics is bad feminism bad equality bad and i think that also plays into the jordan peterson angle in the sense that here are two ideologies that essentially are saying that one your academia is being taken over by leftists and two all your video games and entertainment is being ruined by leftists and you only have to go one step further with these people who feel that way like i like batwoman but now i don't like that she's a black um bisexual woman um, the SJWs are ruining everything for me. And I guess you can frame it to them as like, look, the leftists will not stop until they've destroyed everything just for the sake of it, essentially, in their opinion. So it's really not hard, in my opinion, to go from gamer anti-SJW culture or cultural Marxism, Jordan Peterson fans or whatever, to jump then from more radical beliefs. And all you really have to do with these two you know, concepts is throw the racial element in that 
this is actually being done by someone like George Soros or, or just Jewish conspiracy in general. I don't think it's really a massive leap. And that's why I think in this internet age, it's a lot, a lot easier for both young people and also easier for people who traditionally wouldn't be in the alt-right and you wouldn't think so, like gay people or, or furries. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll throw it back to you on that point, but I'm happy to talk about that a bit more as well. But yeah, let me know what you think about what I've just said. So I think there's an aspect that we need to bring up where because you, you talked a lot about Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson defines himself in a lot of ways by, you know, his enemies. In fact, actually, there was a there was a article written about him ages ago where an interviewer went to his house and he was surrounded by Marxist propaganda. And yeah, that, yeah. he he said it was because it reminded him of who his enemies were and the world that he has to constantly fight against. I feel like you just create a super toxic environment for yourself if you are only defined by what you're not. Al always. Like, you get this a lot with, like, um, uh, you were mentioning the, the kind of new atheism angle for this. You get this a lot with new atheists who end up adopting really toxic forms of anti-theism. They're defined by what they're not. They're not a theist. And by not being a theist, they are also not susceptible to... Uh, you know, mumbo jumbo, which means that they must necessarily be the opposite of it. They fall for a black and white fallacy. They must necessarily be the opposite, so they don't fall for mumbo jumbo like the theists do, so that when they're handed something like phrenology, for example, uh, they go, well, I'm not going to fall for mumbo jumbo, and this sounds intuitively correct. Suddenly you have somebody believing that there's a racial component to IQ. It it doesn't take long. You were mentioning how there it doesn't take you know, that many steps to get you from one form of problematic belief to another, that plays out the same way in multiple times. If you believe that the world is against you, it's not hard to think that the, uh, what was it? Uh, you see this with like Alex Jones, where Alex Jones will go, you know, the world is against us. We are Christians. We're going to be persecuted. They go from there to go, okay, well, it's the Bilderbergers that are against us. Well, it's only one step away from the Bilderbergers to just say, well, it's anybody who's globalist. And it's only a step away from globalists to just go, well, hold on. The globalists are all the Jews. It doesn't take you long in a lot of these spaces. Uh, it's almost like a, it's almost kind of like an onion where like every single layer you go down, you're going closer to the core, but it's all, it's all still part of the same onion. Find somebody arguing about the globalists. You're going to find somebody in their audience who's going to argue about the Jews. You're, you're going to peel back those layers and you're going to find those people. And it's not really coincidental. And the worst part is every single person on every single layer of that onion probably believes that they are at the final layer of that onion and anybody under them is an extremist. Those are the extremist crazies without realizing they're all kind of part of the same thing. Um, and it's not necessarily a, it's, it's not necessarily a slippery slope. Because it's not necessary that you will find yourself at the bottom of the onion. You're not going to find yourself at the core by starting at one point. But you are part of it. You are going to be part of that problem. With Jordan Peterson, he may not be, like, in, in his heart of hearts, he's not a Nazi. He's not an alt-writer in his heart of hearts. But the language he uses is the same language that the alt-right uses. And as a result, he becomes very, very, uh, he becomes very attractive to them. He can argue that, no, 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 the alt-right doesn't like me. And it's like, no, the alt-right doesn't like you, but they find you to be a useful idiot. Just like when Richard Spencer did the same thing with Sargon of Akkad, pointing out that Sargon of Akkad was a very useful uh, gateway into the alt-right. Because if you uh, if you find a Sargon, you're going to find a quartering. And if you find a quartering, you're going to find a Richard Spencer. And if you find a Richard Spencer, well, you're already here. Like, welcome, <laughs> welcome to this side of things. You're going to find an E. Michael Jones soon and a Computing Forever. Oh, wait, you're not going to find that. His channel got deleted. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that brings up another, another issue here. We have an issue of algorithms. I'm sure that the the idea of the conservative or the alt-right pipeline has been brought up a lot in lefty spaces. 
there is an angle to that that we might need to talk about because if you are on let's say that you you are a a, a depressed person with anxiety and you are listening to Jordan Peterson because when he talks about you know how the world uh you you your place in the world your place in the hierarchy is to be this masculine man you are to bring order to the world in some way shape or form and you need to take responsibility for not having done that so a lot of what his lectures end up coming down to you're listening to that as sort of self-help it doesn't take you long to go from that to joe rogan and go from joe rogan if you're doing audio play to go from joe rogan to alex jones and then to go from alex jones to paul joseph watson and then from paul joseph watson you start getting closer and closer to whatever you consider the final boss of the alt-right internet to be, you can get there eventually through YouTube's algorithm, but that's not necessarily a problem of algorithms. That's not saying that YouTube's algorithm favors conservatives and that's a horrible thing. It's more that they're better at hijacking that algorithm. At least that's... Yeah, yeah, we were talking about that before a bit with the cross-pollination of their audiences. So I, I think that's true to an extent... I do, but like we were also saying, I do think YouTube does lean conservative of its bias. But um, no, I, I think it's really interesting what you say about the pipeline. I've made a video about it in terms of Joe Rogan, but what I kind of focused on was um, the way the podcast goes. So Joe Rogan and H3H3 have had multiple, maybe controversial people, Jordan Peterson among them, and you said some other people like Alex Jones, Stephen Molyneux. And the bad thing about Joe Rogan is that he's this like libertarian centrist and there isn't much pushback ever to what his audience say unless it's really out there. Like Candace Owens, for example, was talking about how like, climate change isn't happening and he pushed back against that. But when he says Ben Shapiro is one of the smartest people he knows, he says Jordan Peterson is one of the smartest people he knows. If you watch them, there isn't a lot of pushback. And the thing with Joe Rogan is I've realized a lot of people watch every single um, interview like they just watch them all or listen to them all. Yeah, which is really it, weird it's to podcast me. Because... Style. They'll just like they'll just yeah. binge it. Yeah, and even though like for me, I'm just like, oh, Edward Snowden won. I'm interested in Edward Snowden. I'll watch that one or Oliver Stone. I'll watch that one. I'm not gonna sit through Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro for three hours because why would I do that? Because it just you know <laughs> uh, rot my brain. But um, the annoying thing is, is that like the platform has these people that seem as very reasonable. And to your audience, I'm from the UK. Ben Shapiro's political views are not mainstream conservative. They are very, very radical conservative. The same with people um, on the right in America traditionally. And America has this problem where the political spectrum is not, you know, centre right, centre left, left right, like maybe we have in Britain and Europe, where in the Tory party you have the centre leftist and you have the left wing. In the in, in the Tory party, I mean, you have centre right and right wing. In the in the Labour party, you have centre left and left wing. So you can easily identify, like, you know, if I'm listening to Jacob Rees-Mogg, who's this, like, massive Tory, like, royalist, he's probably on one side of the spectrum. If I listen to Jeremy Corbyn, he's on the other side. But with with America, it's a bit weird where, like, some people will actually say Ben Shapiro is a centrist. And in that framing with Joe Rogan, it's like, this guy is worth listening to. But if you break down his views on Muslims, LGBT people, that is very radical. And like you're saying with the pipeline, if I'm listening to Ben Shapiro already in this format um, and his views are getting into my head, that is already setting you up for radicalization. And if you listen to all of these people in the pipeline, Dave Rubin and his guests, Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, then I think you're primed to become further right in your political views and not saying any of these guys specifically are like all right, but their views combined together do make up the bedrock of what a lot of fascists believe, like Ben Shapiro's views about all Muslims being extremists and incompatible with the West, Jordan Peterson about cultural Marxism, or, you know, even more radical people like Alex Jones, that you're going through a whole different angle there. But yeah, I, I definitely believe YouTube is, I wouldn't say complicit in terms of like, apparently they don't even know how the algorithm works themselves. But when you have this cross-pollination and the pipeline, and these very, very toxic people who are very normalized by friendly chats on podcasts or just the American dominance of social media where Ben Shapiro isn't seen as a radical extremist until he goes on BBC News and tries to debate um, a British conservative and gets made to look like he's an extremist. You don't have that with Americans. 
And that's why I think YouTube and Western viewing of YouTube and primarily American viewing of YouTube does drive this extremism and drive this you know, pipeline to extremism because these things are so normalized. You know, someone like Donald Trump is just, you know, so outwardly racist, um, doesn't even try and hide it. And you have 70 million Americans voting for that. And that, that's, I guess, what the problem is in America is that that is deemed acceptable. You will have lots of nice people, I guess, even nice families and the white, fa- you know, the white families will talk about white picket fence, 50 style, and they will vote for someone who has the most awful views of black people, women, and just other minorities. Like it's a lot of it comes down to our Overton window here. We've got a, we have a weird problem. Uh, it, you brought up Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro actually talks about this and if you listen to the way he talks about economics, he seems to talk about them very much like they're just a straight line. Like you've got the left, which has, you know, socialism, communism, and authoritarianism, which means that, you know, through the magic of the black and white fallacy, if you go to the right, then you would naturally have capitalism, but also individualistic freedom. Like yeah. that, that, those things would have to go hand in hand which completely ignores the existence of things like oligarchies, which are authoritarianism and also capitalism having a lovely baby. Um, When he presents these things, he presents them in such intuitive, simplistic terms where you go, yeah, no, it makes sense. Um, It makes sense that the, the right would be for freedom and the left would be for, you know, enslavement, basically. And it sucks because the way he presents his stuff, he presents it um, in, in philosophy. The word we've used is sophistry. He uses sophistry where he gets to speak very quickly and he gets to use, uh, you know, fallacious reasoning to come to conclusions that sound very intuitively correct. The, the mark of a good sophist is that a good sophist can convince you that they're not a sophist. Um, and there's... <clears throat> Sorry, trying not to not to breathe in all of the stuff from, <laughs> from trying to sneeze. But there's an element of, you know, algorithms at work when you are listening to Shapiro and you take those you take those first things in and then you suddenly land on a Candace Owens. And you're like, oh, well, these people are both smart and they like each other because you'll have Candace Owens and Ben Shapiro talk about each other. Yeah. Then you suddenly land on places like Prager U. That brings us into one of the issues of of the United States Overton window. Our Overton window is shifted so far to the right, and we have even, like, neoliberal people in the United States who go, no, our Overton window isn't shifted far to the right. We're definitely not to the right. You see, I'm a neoliberal, and I'm a centrist, and I don't see our Overton window being shifted so far. You find a right-wing person from any other country, they're going to look like one from ours. They're like, well, no... Go through the conservative, go through the Republican Party of the United States and try to find a true blue conservative that isn't just taking the current status quo and adopting that as their their position. You yeah. generally don't find it, at least not here. We also have an issue that, you know, there in the UK, you guys have a parliamentary government. It's easier for you guys to have a bit of nuance in your politics when here we have a winner takes all you know, par- uh, two-party dominant government. Yeah. It's a lot harder for us to actually get nuance in our politics. You get this monolithic idea of what a Republican is, what a Democrat is, and then Democrats and Republicans end up having to operate based on those preconceptions of what their, uh, of what their party should be doing. And this makes it very easy, especially in the United States, for groups like the alt right to paint people in a very uh, the in philosophy we'd use this as a, this is a hasty generalization fallacy, it's easy for them to paint people all with the same brush. If you have an alt right person who goes no 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 no, we're not conservative. We are traditional. We are not just like the Republicans. They're bought out by corporate interests, and we're not by the Democrats. They can point that they're all are they're all from the same side. They can bring you into this insular group. And when they bring you into that insular group, they can then go, okay, so when we vote, we're going to vote Republican because they're the closest to us. 
and then you get you know more Donald Trumps. I am I'm terrified of what's going to happen in the next four years because I feel like the Republican Party is going to take what the alt right did last time and use it again because they know that it's easier for them to cater to the alt right because they've already got a lot of those conservative viewpoints and they can easily cater to that when you've only got the two parties the alt right's not going to endorse like a random extremist candidate and go they're my guy they're going to endorse the thing that they think is going to win yeah and, and i guess the thing in america right now is when do we stop okay. using the term like alt right as a fringe group when one party will pretty much outwardly adopt the politics of the alt-right, may, maybe just downplay the overt racism against Jewish people. But I mean, like, when I see people like Ben Shapiro or Jordan Peterson uh, as, like, right-wing people in Canada and America, and then people like Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, Lindsey Graham, and I'm like, is there, is there really too much of a difference here? Like, we, we, we are talking about, like, a step, and I think there is a step between Jordan Peterson and the alt-right. But, and I think it's maybe like a significant step, but is there a massive step for voting and supporting Ted Cruz or supporting Donald Trump and becoming a fascist, especially when you saw what was going on in America? Like that's a fascist dream. Like, you know, America, um, Donald Trump ordering a local sheriff's department to ice an Antifa protester who shot um, a Trump supporter or people getting snatched in black vans and taken away for protesting racism and stuff. I don't really see if there's, you know, the, if there's a line between um, conservatism in America and they're such sycophants uh, for the GOP party, like there's there's no dissent anymore. Like we've seen with the votes on, on the COVID bill, it's like one party votes for it, one, po one party completely votes against it. And there, there's no nuance, there's no division. And when you're, the party's being driven by people like Donald Trump, even from the back seat at the moment, I don't, under, I don't think, you know, anymore in America... There is a concrete, real difference, especially when people like Steve Bannon are in government, between the alt-right and conservatism. I think it is blending it into one, scarily enough. I think the only thing is when you see with someone like Ben Shapiro, uh, you were talking about Nick Fuentes and stuff and the cat is, the only big thing I can think of is that the alt-right are very, very anti-Israel because of their anti-Semitism. And I think that's just the last part Republicans won't adopt because of this other racist view of christian um fundamentalism which believes israel are the key to armageddon because they need to go to war with iran um and the christians um you know the jews will all be killed by god and stuff and the christians are the chosen people and everything so it's like um for me it, it's it's got to this point where the alt-right like we're talking about it's, it's gone away but i think it's just been normalized a lot more in the sense that like only really minor differences distinguish them from trump conservatives i don't know if, if you have a similar view on that but in my view looking from the uk and you've had and the american politics has had a scary influence on our politics as well but that, that's the, that's the way i see it because I, I like i said ben shapiro is no moderate um lots of these people are no moderates they're all pretty radical in their views so i think you might be right that a lot of it has been normalized the issue that we run into, though, is that the United States has been drifting on the whole further right for the last few decades anyway. Yeah. So it's hard to figure out where where the alt-right as a fringe group got more adopted in, or if it's more that we started moving more right so we became uh, more desensitized to this. Or is it that we've gotten so used to the existence of this group here that we're desensitized to it. I honestly don't know which one it is. And the scary part about that is that that makes it hard for somebody who the alt-right would prey on to know the difference too, because then they might see this as just, as opposed to a fringe group that maybe they shouldn't be screwing with, they see this more as something that's normalized, that it's just one of their many options they can fall into politically. And that's kind of where I have... <sighs> a bit of an issue because embracing neo-Nazi ideology is not an end goal. It's more of a consequence. It's a consequence of these groups preying on people. When you spend all your time, it, it creates another issue. When you've got people like me who spend a lot of time dunking on, on neo-Nazis, dunking on people who are, are there, what we're not doing is addressing the actual systemic problem that created them in the first place. We're addressing the consequence. We're hitting the symptom, 
we're effectively acting like cold medicine, but we're not properly acting like a vaccine. We're not doing stuff to change the environment that bred these people. We're just dealing with the people who got bred as a consequence of this environment. So when you're talking about how the alt-right just kind of gets integrated into American politics on the whole, as scary as that is, um, you do run into this issue where the alt-right then has to take the next step. They have to emotionally invest anybody who comes in into the alt-right. When you've got a, a Republican, uh, their emotional investment a lot of times is religious. They're a, they're a God-fearing conservative. The Republicans are the parties of the God-fearing conservatives. There's their emotional investment. The, their love for the Republican Party can be proportional to their love for Jesus, almost. Um, with the alt-right, how do you get somebody emotionally invested there? I would argue that what they do is they isolate people from those other uh, political ideologies. And that's where you get the emotional investment from. When the only people you can talk to effectively, when the only people who, quote, understand you are the people in those groups, that seems to me to be where the alt-right seems to thrive, when they can isolate somebody. Also, it's looking like Zoom has frozen. Yes, Zoom has frozen. That's weird. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, yeah, turning the alt-right into a cult. So, I am less okay calling it a cult and more okay calling it maybe an abusive relationship. I know that's a, that's taking literally from what uh, Innuendo Studios argues in a lot of his videos. But I think when you call it a cult, there's a lot of baggage attached to it there. And there's a lot of uh, technical language you have to engage in. I think it operates more like an abusive relationship where you've got a bunch of people who can emo emotionally hold you hostage. At least that's yeah, what it, I, that's what it runs as to me. Yeah, no, I, I feel like that as well. And um, I, I think just to transition a tiny bit, just to, to I don't know if this could be the last section is um, the weird contradictions. Now, like in my mind, you're talking about like a lot of God fearing conservatives and adopting maybe more nationalist, national socialist sort of, I don't know, not, maybe not socialist points of it, but like viewpoints like that. And I think that's like a more logical thing. But I think what's interesting just maybe as the final segment is to talk about, and I know you probably have some uh, strong views on this, is like the illogical elements, because we've been focusing a lot on white men um, and republicanism and everything, masculinity. But I think it gets a bit more interesting, um, and at least for me with my content, this is what I found interesting, is the real contradictions of groups who join the alt-right in America. So in the videos I've done so far, I've looked at um, environmentalism, which sounds very contradictory, um, occultism, um, furries and bronies, femboys, gamers, uh, and even gay people. And I, I think like it, it, it's a nice like way to wrap up uh, the conversation, tying it back to the original point, is about this sense of isolation but while we were talking to start with about like the white man in Western society expects a certain thing and maybe there's some mental health elements that play into it. There's also the groups that would be the almost the first casualties of a fascist regime, um, gay people, uh, certainly. Um, but then, you know, people like furries and, and uh, for example, have a stereotype as some sort of like sexual de degeneracy in, in fascism. Um, but it's interesting there's a significant subsection of them that will join these groups now like for example uh, you you can elaborate on some of the other stuff but like for a gay person ernst uh room i think i'm saying that right was the leader of the brown shirts in germany a uh, nazi germany he was eventually um killed by the nazis but he was pretty openly gay and hitler knew he was gay um and what he believed and how he rationalized this you know being being gay in the 30s with fascist beliefs was that you know lots of greeks back in the day uh who fought in these wars including you know the spartans were gay and they had brotherhood with their fellow man and this is a guy who fought in world war one so um you know if these guys their role isn't to have you know children and be father figures you can still be a gay person and exist as this militant masculine figure and of course as you know we know and he, he found out through eventually being killed and stuff is that fascists won't ever accept that 
but they will use you to an extent to gain power. And I think that goes to show with a lot of these groups in terms of even if it's furries and bronies or, or gay people or femboys is that the alt-right as like this more radical fringe group will use whoever they can get to start with just to spread their views across various sub communities and anything like that doesn't mean they'll ever accept you then dissecting why these people would join is the interesting thing so gay people can rationalize it in a certain way like the leader of the brown shirts back in the day could but then if you're for example someone i featured in my brown in my furry video was gay and a furry and he was um i think he was also half asian half white as well which makes it even more complicated and then you've got to ask yourselves what are the things that drive someone like that to join an ideology which is completely against his own existence and it's a lot of different things like mental health problems lack of you know, prospects or just maybe spending way too much time online or something like that but it, it, it's, it's an interesting contradiction within it and I could talk all day about it in terms of i've made like seven or eight videos on it but I, I don't know what your feeling is on the people who aren't you know, prime candidates for joining because of the views of the alt-right, but still end up joining anyway. So I think for me, the interesting part comes down to disenfranchisement. The uh, The people who get brought into the alt-right, and I know that we keep using the alt-right as like almost a monolithic thing. It's not really a monolith. Yeah. The alt, alt-right is less a term you can use to describe a group as it more as it is more an adjective about ideology. But that adjective about ideology is so fringe that it creates in groups anyway, so functionally it ends up operating that way anywho. But disenfranchisement seems to be the biggest thing. When you have uh, historically gay people, uh, they're going to try to find an in-group. The alt-right can offer them an in-group. They're going to be considered a useful Id idiot, but they can be offered that in-group regardless. Furries can find their way into there as well, like you mentioned, and it makes sense because if the first group that is willing to take their their anxieties about their place in the world and, and how to be proper properly existent in the world is somebody who has alt-right ideology, they're going to hold on to that. Like, the first person who ever accepted you for who you are is always going to have an impact on your life, even if they were only accepting it for pragmatic reasons. That's still going to have an, an, an effect on your life. And I think the aspect of that that causes people to get used is why it ends up operating a lot like an abusive relationship. You're there for what you can provide to the cause, whatever the cause happens to be, whether that alt-ripe in-group is is dealing with Gamergate, whether they're dealing with, you know, Jewish conspiracies, whether they're trying to do things like dox Alex Jones' ex-wife for being a Jew, as is something that uh, the Daily Stormer argued that they could do whenever they turned on Alex Jones. Depending on what it is, they'll find a way to use you and it's easier, like, all, even even standard gangs, like, local gangs, a lot of their stuff begins with brotherhood that is predicated on disenfranchisement. And disenfranchisement is exacerbated by depression, by anxiety, by, by mental illness. All of that stuff creates this melting pot. So it makes sense that even though people who would be the first people to be on the firing line uh, if the alt-right were to gain power and gain like a massive, massive foothold without any restrictions, it makes sense that they would still find their way in there because to some of these people, those might be the first and only people that ever accepted them for who they are, who didn't criticize them for existing. Because you can have somebody who's very progressive, but as soon as they encounter a furry, they immediately start going, eh, that one might be a step too far. But if somebody wants to use you because of your unique position, they might be willing to overlook all of that, at least publicly, so long as it's useful for you. Take uh, one of the things Richard Spencer mentioned uh, in an interview when he was talking about free speech. When talking about free speech, he was asked, you know, do we actually want free speech? Does the alt-right care about free speech? And Richard Spencer said, no, we don't want free speech, but... It is necessary for us to advocate for it until we have the power to take it away. Just like with furries, they may not like them. They may think that they are sexual degenerates that need to be, you know, taken out of the world. But they will use them to their own ends. Yeah. And it's like, um, also, like, you touched on a kind of good point. I guess it would be my final point about this whole topic is that, like, 
with furries and bronies, you were saying about like even a progressive might not accept them. And it's like, um, like it, I know maybe a lot of your audience, I know a lot of my audience are furries. I'm not passing like judgment, but a lot of people in mainstream society be like, well, that's really weird. Um, you like dress up as, you know, in a fur costume or you have this furry persona and you all role play these characters. That's really strange. I can't accept it. Or you're an adult man who likes My Little Pony, which is for um, young girls. Uh, that's creepy or something like that. And just, you know, I, I'm not passing judgment to keep it real, but like a lot of people not accepting that right or left, they're not accepting that. So I guess that drives people online a bit more. And in terms of these communities that might have this siege mentality mindset, like no one really accepts us in public. And then you have maybe the alt-right who have lots of people just like that, maybe can sympathize, empathize with these people. It's, I guess when you break it down in that way, it's not surprising. It's just a bit surprising that surely a lot of them, which most of them do, let's not pretend like most of the furries and bronies are Nazis and stuff. Um, some of them will be like, well, you know, you might you might be totally against my existence, but hey, let me spread your ideology around and maybe help you get a bit more powerful. Yeah, and it's it a, a lot of it comes down as well where you've got the the arguments of free speech where they'll go, well, I don't agree with everybody here. Um, but I think my last point is going to be something called contact hypothesis. When you have contact with a walk of life, the more contact you have with it, the more easy it is for you to tolerate it. And it may even be easier for you to spread it around. So for instance, I hang in a lot of circles who like video games, anime, stuff like that. Changing my character into a Neko girl, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't affect me. But I also go to anime conventions. So, like, for me, that's a perfectly standard, normal thing to do. But that yeah. comes down to the amount of contact I've had with it. Somebody who hasn't had contact with it, it's going to be weird. It's the exact same thing for less benign views. If you have somebody uh, like a Stephen Molyneux who believes that, you know, race and IQ are linked and that if you have a, a homogenetic society, uh, that society is necessarily going to be better for the people within it. He'll use Poland as his example. Um... If you are constantly, even if it's parasocially, like just from watching YouTube videos of this person, if you are constantly having contact with this idea, the likelihood that you are desensitized to it increases. So if a furry finds themselves in an alt-right styled group and they don't agree with everything, but they're hearing about it every day, give it a few months. Their position yeah. will either change or they'll just become desensitized to it and it'll be like, oh no, that's just John over there. He's just making jokes. He just makes jokes about the Jews. He doesn't mean anything, but if you handed John a gun and took away all, all uh, responsibility for his actions, well, John might not be making as many jokes there. Um, so it sucks that a lot of people find themselves in this when they're vulnerable, when they're depressed. Anybody who's, who's vulnerable and looking for purpose can find themselves in these groups. Others don't really understand the way that they think, but they think that the people in the in-group do. Uh, and this increases their contact with those ideologies. At first, they tolerate the dissenting views, and then eventually they either become desensitized or they just adopt the in-group's rhetoric. The result, though, is the same. You end up having more people from the outside. It looks like more people are adopting these ideologies, and that shifts the Overton window. Whether you're just desensitized and tolerating it, or you are adopting it outright from the outside, it still changes the social zeitgeist in the exact same way. I think that's my final point. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think we could literally talk about this topic um, for <laughs> hours and hours. It's so interesting. And I, I know we've we've gone over how much we plan to do as well. But um, but yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And uh, you know, I think I think we covered a lot of ground. Um, maybe there is a part two one day but <laughs> but yeah no um i, I know it, it was a really good conversation i mean uh i always find this stuff really interesting let's just please hope it maybe goes away a bit <laughs> i'm i'm hoping it does as well and if, if i can at least be part of getting some people away from that then i will be incredibly thankful for that with that yeah. said i do want to thank everybody for watching if you're watching this on my channel live or afterwards when i've clipped this 
uh, please check the description. There's going to be a link to the Cavernacles uh, YouTube channel down there awesome. so that maybe we can get, maybe we can start building our own pipeline a little bit better and a little more effectively, <laughs> yeah. uh, get people moving around in less toxic lefty circles and not uh, other ones there. I've got a lot of furries in my community. I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, yeah, so I, I, I do as well. <laughs> That's why I was saying, you know, I'm, I'm not judging at all. <laughs> so... <laughs> With that said, if you're watching over on my end, please go ahead and subscribe. If you end up watching this over on Cavernacle's end, if he mirrors this over on his channel, yeah. uh, please check out my channel. I cover politics and, and other stuff as well, so woo. I guess I'll just let... Uh, any any final words that you have? Uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Um, I've done a lot of stuff like this, and this probably won't be one of the best, because uh, <laughs> we both get to talk a lot, and they're very non-confrontational as well, very chill um and yeah thanks to everyone uh come subscribe to my channel if if you think you'd like to listen to some of this stuff uh with just me talking about it more in depth there may be some parts we got to go in like uh the history of this stuff and and the actual nazis and uh yeah just thank you so much for having me on and definitely we'll do another part and i'll get you on mine and i'm definitely gonna upload this to my channel as well awesome and insert into video tagline here